Hello, fellow working preachers. This is Caroline Lewis, and I'm excited to announce we are kicking off the spring fundraising campaign today. All gifts made to the spring campaign through May 31st will be doubled with a dollar for dollar match up to $10,000. When you make your gift to the spring campaign, we will send you links to presentations by the Sermon Brainwave team from this year's Festival of Homiletics. Working Preacher would not be possible without generous donors like you, and we are so grateful for each and every one of you. Make your gift online today at workingpreacher.org. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Matt Skinner. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Joy J. Moore. This podcast is for the seventh Sunday of Easter, which falls on May 29th, 2022. Our first reading is Acts 16, 16 through 34, Psalm 97. The second reading is Revelation 22, let's say verses 12 through 21. They want you to skip a few juicy parts there but you don't have to. And then the gospel is John 17, 20 through 26. Now we know that some of you are eager to uh, jump to Ascension Day and to celebrate that on a Sunday. And there are commentaries for the Ascension Day test texts, but we decided not to do a podcast on Ascension Day because we are um, sponsored by the seventh Sunday of Easter. And so therefore we're trying to draw more traffic to the seventh Sunday of Easter. It's also Memorial Day in the United States. Uh, lots going on. Graduation season is upon us, uh, but we're still uh, we're still celebrating Easter here on Summer Brainwave, and uh, and Rolf is still on a bit of a hiatus from the podcast. But if he were here, I think he would probably say, Caroline, why is John seventeen important for uh, for the Easter season? <laughs> Uh, well, that's a uh, that's a great question, and uh, it well, okay. I'll start by answering that question. Uh, why is it important? This is, uh, of course, Jesus' high priestly prayer. It's always a portion of the high priestly prayer is always the seventh Sunday of Easter. So, uh, verse uh, seven, year A, it's one through eleven. Uh, year B, 6 through 19, and year C, here we are, 20 through 26. So you have uh, this, this last portion of the, of the high priestly prayer. Why is it important for Easter? Uh, I think uh, this year, I would say uh, the way in which this particular portion of the prayer. So this prayer, this portion of the prayer is where Jesus specifically prays for the believers yet to be. And so the first part of the prayer, first third, he is preach, he is praying for himself. Uh, the second portion of the prayer, he prays for his disciples who are remaining or in the world. And then these are for uh, this prayer is for the disciples or the believers yet to be. I have other sheep that are not of this fold, John 10, 16, John 3, 16. Uh, Jesus will, and when uh, in the resurrection appearance in John 20, will say, as the Father has sent me, so also I send you. Uh, and and so this is this is for the believers that, that the disciples will uh, bring into the fold, so to speak. And so why is that important for Easter? It reminds us of the importance of our witness and our testimony. Big theme in John, but it also uh, it, it, it reminds us of what, what is it that we're saying in the world? What are we testifying to? Uh, this is not about, uh, this is not about, there's no such thing in the Gospel of John of evangelism, you know, that word doesn't exist. Uh, John uses the, the language of witness and testimony. So I think on this last Sunday of Easter, it reminds us to what will we testify? What will we say about the resurrection? How will we continue to live uh, live the promise of the resurrection? If you've been saying the last couple of weeks, uh, Matt, the ethic of the resurrection, uh, how will that be embodied uh, from here on out? What does the, what does the resurrection say? Uh, what kind of promises does it uh, does it does it communicate? 
uh, that we want to live by and testify to. And, and in that testifying, in that witnessing, uh, imagining that, uh, that people are listening and, uh, and what does our witness, our invitation, our testimony sound like? So that would be my first response. But I think this also answers the question that you asked us a couple of weeks ago. Uh, what does this glory look like? Uh, as you said, Caroline, these words of Jesus reveal that God has always had the whole world in mind when forming a people who reflect God's promise, regardless of geography, social identification, or time. Jesus is praying for us, praying for those who will hear and believe. And, and so this is the ongoing story. And, and sometimes we reflect so much on the coming kingdom of God that we miss that simply Jesus loves people and salvation is restoring the wholeness of humanity individually and collectively. And that restoration is evident in our being known for loving one another. So every blessing, every healing, every miracle is evidence of the reconciliation of the human with our creator God. And when we're one with God and one with each other, the glory that God gave Jesus is evident in us because we love one another, a love that is evident as being that community of everyone from around the world. This is, uh, whenever, I, whenever I teach John, which does indeed happen sometimes, <laughs> I get myself to teach it so I can understand it better, or at least um, indwell it better. But I do think that that final line in the in the high priestly prayer, which is also the final line in the farewell discourse, which is also the final line in kind of the pre-passion narrative of of the gospel, depending upon when you consider that, is the is is a thesis statement, maybe not the thesis statement, but a thesis statement of the gospel that that mm -hmm. Jesus' purpose for coming was so that we might share this, the same, <clears throat> the same divine love that the father shares with him or that Jesus shares with God, that that kind of intimacy is not a special uh, kind of elite intimacy that we just get to look upon from a distance, but that we're supposed to experience in terms of that being the, the point or the purpose. So I always thought that, and then I read the commentary and made a stamper uh, talks about how but it's also something, it's this idea of a oneness or a perfection that even goes beyond our experience, that there's something here that's, I don't know how else to describe it, but a kind of primal kind of universal sense of unity and, and wholeness that seems to fit with John's really elevated Christology and, and this idea of, a, of, a, of union and oneness being where God is discovered, where God is found, where true communion happens with one another. You can take that in weird ways if you wanted to, I suppose, but there's something there that, that always reminds me that, you know what I mean? That the Christian unity is not just simply how we get along so that the church can survive, but Christian unity is an expression of where divinity is encountered, where divinity is taking the world, uh, the God is a God that's always drawing in. The God is a God who's always making disparate things connected to one another and, and in relationship. Is that right? Yeah. Did I get it right? <laughs> <laughs> Am I close? Am I in no, the ballpark? I, I think that's, I think that's, yeah, that's right on. And, and to talk about that, that oneness as uh, it, that oneness that is very much present now. I mean, I think the other, another answer to your original question, Matt, is, uh, well, it's, when you look at the last line, right, of the, of the high priestly prayer, I made your name known to them, and I will make it known, so that they, the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. Uh, if you go back to the beginning of the prayer, 17.3, and this is eternal life, that... <laughs> they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. And so that, that the eternal life or abundant life is, is that oneness here and now. And that language of knowing 
Uh, now that we're, you know, this is the, of course, end of the farewell discourse, and now Jesus, we move into the passion narrative after this. But that language of knowing really goes back to the whole purpose of Jesus presence in the world in the first place, according to John, which is John 1 18. No one has ever seen God. It is God, the one and only who is close at the father's uh, breast who makes God known. Uh, and <clears throat> I talk about this uh, in various, many and sundry places, but that making known there uh, is uh, ex ago. Ago is to lead or bring, and uh, ex is out. That God, that God brings uh, Jesus brings God out in that kind of um, uh, into this into this relationship. Uh, that, like you said, Matt, is so important. It's not something that we observe. That we're we're intimately in it, uh, and so. This is where John gets confusing. I know John gets confusing in a lot of different ways, but the way in which sort of these all these synonyms swirl around to try to get us to not understand, but to experience that abiding, knowing one, I am in you, you are in me, abiding place. I mean, it's 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 like it's like if you can just think of like John looked at his thesaurus and like, how many words can I come up with <laughs> to, to create this abundance of knowing or abundance of relationship? That's, that's kind of what's happening here. And it's all coming together at the prayer. And I think with, how did you say it last week that the promise of God is not a place but God's presence. Mm -hmm. And when mm -hmm. we are bearing God's image, it is our presence too. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's good news. <laughs> I mean, another direction you can take with this is just to uh, remember that uh, there, uh, that there is no Lord's prayer in the gospel of John. Uh, and so, uh, you know, what, what does this say about the, why does Jesus pray here and now? Uh, what does that say about the purpose of prayer? How is this a model for prayer? Uh, that could be a completely different kind of sermon, but it's uh, worth one to say, kind of to dive into a sort of a specificity of prayer uh, that uh, that John offers uh, that we that is different in the other gospels, uh, but we pray that we preach that particularity and uh, a prayer that is. Uh, and I've talked about this a million times, but I still, it's worth saying that the disciples get to overhear. So what does it feel like to, uh, what does it feel like to hear uh, that Jesus prays for you? And Jesus doesn't go off and, you know, disciples fall asleep that then this is a, this is a prayer that they get to overhear every single word. And, uh, and then how do they then take that and embody that? And that's one of the, one of the uh, lines in the commentary that I really appreciate is as Jesus tends, feeds, bears witness and breaks barriers for love, Jesus' own are called to do the same thing. And so that's what it means to be one with Jesus and with God. Power of that, you remind me, uh, Carolina, uh, um, a member of my congregation homeschooled her kids. And uh, um, when uh, her oldest was uh, at uh, the age to enter um, uh, middle school, um, he wanted to go to public school with his friends from church. And so uh, the night before um, he was going to start school, public school, um, his mom was, you know, getting him ready for bed and he stopped her and he said, can you pray with me now? And she said, okay, because she always prayed with them. And he said, and, and, and he said, no, I mean, like you usually do after we go to sleep. And what she, he then told her was that they knew that every night after she had tucked them into bed, she would go back in while they were sleeping and pray for them. And that had made such an imprint in his imagination that that night, which was a special night for him before a very big moment in his life, he wanted to eavesdrop when his mom prayed for him. And as you were reminding us that this is what the disciples are doing, I, I think that story's worth, worth sharing in terms of what does it mean to be able to eavesdrop when someone you trust is putting you 
before the God who, who keeps us. Especially when you have to go to junior high school the next day. Yeah, for the first time. <laughs> Terrifying. Oh my, yes. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Alex. Well, well, this is the continuation of what happens in Philippi. And it's, it's, a, it's a colorful story. It's a long story. It even continues beyond verse 34, where there is a, a public reckoning and kind of a humiliation of the magistrates in town where the, the story won't end until Paul and Silas have been publicly vindicated and, and the, the guardians of Philippi, so to speak, have been thoroughly humiliated as well. So it's, it's a, this is an our God is better than your God kind of a story, which is on one level delightful and kind of fun in a comic booky sort of way, in another way a little bit disturbing at times because of the that kind of insistence on power that shows up in the story. But it's uh, and there's a lot going on here that that deserves attention. There's there's prisoners getting tortured here. There's uh, ugly accusations being hurled in in public then there's also an, an unnamed uh what acts calls a slave girl who uh disappears from the story in a big hurry after being uh, transformed and what happens to the girl is a question that we never hear the answer to is this good news for her bad news for her luke doesn't call the spirit a demon or unclean or anything like that but the thing that kept her in the good graces of her owners is now gone, right? That they see a financial loss. And so it's a little bit chilling to imagine what that means for her mm -hmm. in the midst of this. I'm just saying there's a lot of stuff in here that's gonna catch attention of certain people depending on their own experience. And it's hard to cover every detail because it is a story with so many raw um, events, right? Or misuses of power and people suffering as a result. So I just throw it out there to kind of say, Heads up, there's it, what, what looks like a rollicking fun story has a lot of, um, well, trigger points, I suppose, is one way of describing it. Well, and, and too, even I, I would add to that the, the question, sir, is what must I do to be saved? I mean, that the way in which that question has entered into our common parlance in terms of uh, the function and purpose of religion and and uh, and and what does this text say about that? I think that that's that'd be another trigger point, you know, that uh, what must what, what must I do to be saved? And those questions around salvation and what salvation means and and that I uh, and can I interrupt too and just say, and it's yeah. being asked by a man who's about to kill himself. So I mean, that's also speaking of. Yeah raw nerves in the story, but sorry, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, no, no, go ahead. Yeah, exactly. I, uh, one thing I was kind of struck by this time uh, was talked about a little bit in the commentary, uh, but the, uh, uh, Jerusha Neal talks about uh, the, the freeing power of worship and then moves on, but I just was kind of struck about, and I think it's in part because of a couple of conversations I'd have, I've had in the last couple of days about worship, but worship as uh, worship as an act of resistance or an act of uh, of of um, yeah resistance or or a, a work a work of activism uh, that that or, or work of, even a work of protest. Uh, and the way in which uh, we can recapture some of that reality of what worship is and what worship does, that it's, uh, that it is, it, it, it's disruptive and it actually is under, uh, undermines uh, the powers that be. Uh, and, you know, the, that these men are disturbing our city, uh, that worship disturbs and it gives witness to powers, uh, particularly, obviously, God, uh, that disrupts corrupt power. So I, that's kind of, I don't know, that, uh, and, and particularly within the context of resurrection, of a resurrection being the ultimate, uh, the, you know, the ultimate act of, of um, God undoing power. Uh, that's kind of where I went with. This I, I, 
I appreciate that, Caroline. Uh, I appreciated the commentary because it draws out this attention to the reality of incarceration. Uh, prison in ancient times uh, was not three hots in a cot, uh, nor was it a resume builder to say that you stood for the appropriate cause of the month. Um, so um, it, behind what you're saying, I wonder what it would mean um, for preachers to remind persons of the genuine risk of being faithful uh, to the God in scripture in the midst of a secular age. Uh, that risk in fact dismantles the capitalistic market-driven neoliberalism that continues to enslave individuals. And that enslavement means a few profit excessively on the backs of, of unfair labor practices um, uh, on, uh, against others. And, and so just entertaining the idea of disrupting that system is threatening. It was then and it is now. So yeah, uh, it, it's a different way to look at what are we doing uh, in this moment, just like then when we say we're worshiping the God who raised Jesus from the dead. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, and then I, uh, anything else about that? that pa the passage acts just uh, just gonna say yeah it's it's a, a a powerful text in terms of helping people think about what happens when the gospel of the risen christ encounters the powers of the world and so it's worth spending some time on this passage and understanding what kind of a place philippi was what it meant to be a roman colony uh, what it means to overwhelm a spirit of divination and all of the connections to to Apollo and certain forms of Roman religion, uh, just just to uh, it's worth digging around in, um, in into the commentary on the story, a variety of commentaries on this story that that can help if you want to kind of dislodge certain bedrock assumptions about Christianity as a as a respectable, decent religion mm -hmm. <laughs> that's, that easily conforms to the powers of this world or that somehow is is apolitical entirely. This is a story that that shows provocation and shows clashing interests in a real visceral way. So and it yeah, and uh, yes, thank you for that. And it reminds us too of, I mean, it, it, for me, it i I can't help but think about the response to the resurrection in Luke, which is this is all, you know, this is a bunch of crap. This is nonsense. This is garbage. This is. And and the way in which uh, that you know the taming of the resurrection, uh, the uh, the way in which the gospel itself has be, has um, molded itself and been and the way in which churches and and its uh, the church and its uh, its subsidiaries have uh, bought into a kind of gospel that is uh, safe and tame. And uh, and adapts and adopts all the systems that the gospel came to unend, and um, it's time to it's time to start telling the truth about some of that stuff uh, and and come to Jesus so to speak moment about the kinds of leadership that's expressed uh, in our in our churches and in its as I said it's the subsidiaries. Yeah, amen. Uh, now, if I were going to do the whole worship thing and say, you know, and, and say the way in which worship is disruptive and uh, is an act against empire uh, as an and as a protest against imperialism and capitalism and and that kind of, that and that theme, I would then uh, follow the, the uh, follow the sermon with Psalm 97. So I would have uh, everybody let's to say, OK, let's let's. Let's give voice to that protest. Let's give voice to that uh, that disruptive worship. And then the Lord is king. The Lord is king. Let the earth rejoice. And so that the psalm becomes a, a, a an embodiment of the sermon theme. That's what I would do. I I love this psalm because of Michael W. Smith's song Agnes Day, where he pauses in the midst of that song to read the psalm over the music. And uh, I believe that this text is a setup 
uh, for why we choose God over government, as we've just talked about. So I agree with you, Caroline, that I would make this a response. And if your choir is capable of pulling up that old uh, song from Michael W. Smith to, to sing it and then pause with the music playing under it to read that psalm so that you can actually feel the majesty of God as king, um, to so that we can grasp that um, what it means that we have settled for the imitations of life that are trash when you think about the majesty of a God that trembles the very earth with his righteousness. Mm -hmm. Well, when we get to Revelation, this is the end of our series in Revelation, which was really a series in Revelation 1 and Revelation 21 to 22, but yeah. um, <laughs> a lot gets skipped over. Uh, and, uh, you know, the lectionary committee, I think, might have done you some favors by releasing you from a few verses that would give you a lot of questions during coffee hour. But uh, once again, you've got, you know, if this is what, three weeks in a row of these uh, concluding scenes, uh, culminating scenes. And it's what I love about this. I think it was Brian Blunt who first directed my attention to this, who's done great work in Revelation, that that the the concluding it's almost too small to call it an imperative, but the concluding refrain is come, it's invitation at, at the end. And that might echo back in chapter 18 when Babylon is being destroyed and the command is come out of her, my people, right? separate yourselves from the empire. And now it's this, this invitation to come and indwell this uh, city or come to encounter Christ. And then of course it ends with an invitation for Christ himself to to come as well so a book that's so terrifying both because of its misinterpretation but also when you interpret it right it's terrifying in a number of ways at least does end with this again i think maybe a refrain is the best way of putting it, of invitation and welcome 